1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. Now, Peter continues here in this section of Scripture dealing with the subject of how to deal with suffering. Now, last week we looked at how to control your thought life when you suffer. This morning, what Peter wants to address and what we're going to look at here is how, what should you do when you're in the midst of suffering. There's some specific things you should do. There are four of them here in this text that we're going to discuss this morning. Now, these four things, I believe, are so incredibly important to help you when you are in the midst of suffering. Because every one of us is going to go through trials, and some of us are going to be persecuted, and things are going to get dark in the end times. So how are you going to deal with that? Peter gives some incredibly important wisdom here in this text. Let's just read it. Verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what are the things that Peter encourages these believers to do? What does he encourage you to do? Very important principles. The first here is in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Now, when you read that particular text, the first question that comes in your mind is you think to yourself, well, is Peter mistaken here? I mean, did he think that the second coming was going to happen the next day or the next week or the next month? And I would have to say, absolutely not. He did not think that, and he was not mistaken. Now, why do I say that? Because a misunderstanding of this particular little phrase is the root of, I can't tell you how many crazy, kooky doctrines that have gone through the church. So understanding this one sentence is essential, and especially the little phrase, at hand. That statement, the end of all things is at hand. This particular, these two words are one Greek word that literally means drawing near or drawing nearer. Now, that makes a big difference when you read this. The end of all things is drawing nearer. Well, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Paul made this same statement in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Paul said there, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So was Peter mistaken? Not at all. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew exactly what the plan was. He's telling these people who are suffering and struggling with persecution, he's saying, Look, keep your eyes fixed on the end of all things. That is drawing nearer, and it's drawing nearer every single day. Now, there are two ends. There's the end of my life, and there is the end of all things. As if I were a believer in the first century, and I was suffering for my faith, and I was being persecuted, I was in prison, I would be thinking, one day down, another day closer to the Lord's return. Now, I hope you think that way 
Because I sure do. It is the way you should be thinking about life. One day closer, whether it's my death or the end of the age. Now, Paul separates people into two categories. People who die or people who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. And one of the two is going to take place for every one of us. We're either going to die before the second coming or we're going to be alive and we're going to remain until that day. So basically here Peter is just saying fix your eyes on the end. There is a deliverance coming for you whether it's in your life or the end of the age. Now that is an essential thing because this is what keeps a person and encourages a person that is in the midst of great suffering. Now did Jesus tell the disciples that he was going to come very quickly or that it was going to be a long time before he came? Which is it? Jesus made it very clear. I believe that he told them it was going to be a long time. He says it many times in his ministry. Let me just show you two passages. In Matthew 25, verse 19, there Jesus is speaking about the end of the age. He's speaking about the end of time. And he says this in a parabolic sense. He says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And that's what the Lord is going to do. He's going to come and he's going to settle accounts with every single person on this earth, including you and me. Now, how long is it going to be? A long time. Jesus doesn't use that terminology if he was not trying to convey that to his disciples. Again, in Luke 20, verse 9. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. So when Jesus repeats something several times, that's important. You should take these verses, you should box in that little phrase there, a long time, because that's his point making it clear. And yet, should I expect that the Lord should come at any time? Absolutely. I am to be ready. For in such an hour, Jesus said, as you think not, the Son of Man comes. So he can come at any time, and you need to be ready for that. But he made it absolutely clear it's going to be a long time. So the point Peter is trying to make here is keep your eyes fixed on the fact there is an end. There is an end to your life, there is an end to your suffering, and there is an end to this age. Now Jesus made that point very often as well. You remember the parable of the tares. Remember the simple parable. A man went out, sowed seed in his field, and when he slept, that there was an enemy that came and sowed tares in the field. And these two grew up together. And then, at harvest time, the reapers went out, reaped the, the harvest, they brought in the harvest, and they separated the wheat from the tares. The tares were cast into a fire and burned. The wheat was brought into the barn. Jesus interpreted this particular parable in Matthew 13, 37 through 43. He said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus believes that there is a very specific moment in time where this age, this world, all that's going on today is going to end. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. 
Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the, notice again, end of the age. He says it a second time. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I say to you this morning, I pray that you have ears to hear. There is an end to the age, and it is coming. I have no idea when that will take place, but it will take place. And if I die before that, then that's the end of my suffering. And I am going to go and I'm going to stand in the presence of God. So this is, I believe, a fundamental issue for anyone in the midst of suffering. Fix your eyes. There is an end. There is an end. And this life is really short. Eternity is a really a long time. Now the second thing that Peter addresses here in, is in verse 7, which I believe is... Again, an essential part, a vital part of the Christian life in the midst of suffering. He says, be serious in prayer. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now the word serious means to be sane or in your right mind. Be thinking about this. Keep your head and be in prayer. If you want to keep your head in the right place, you need to be praying. The word watchful means to be self-controlled. It is sometimes also used for not being drunk. So he's saying here, you need to be clear-headed. You need to keep your head in the right place, and you do that by prayer. Now, why is prayer brought up here in this context? Well, I'll tell you, if there is anything you need in the midst of suffering, and you will need as the days grow darker in, in this world, you're going to need prayer. Why? Because prayer is where you get the power to endure, to stand. This is where you get the, the ability to control your thought life, which was our previous study last week. You need to pray. So are you serious about prayer? I think that that is an, an essential question to ask. You need to be serious about prayer because that is where your strength is going to be found. When you are in a dark time in your life, you are struggling, you are going to be, need to connect with the God of heaven. You're going to have to connect with him and touch his, the hem of his garment and he's going to touch you and you're going to know it. If you don't have that experience, you don't have a serious prayer life, you are going to fall. It's going to happen because you are going to be running on your own strength. And that's not going to cut it. It's not going to happen. Now, I want to ask every one of you here this morning, have you had a, an experience in prayer where you have asked God to touch you forgive you, strengthen you, empower you, and sensed the power of the Holy Spirit actually come upon you and change the way you think and feel? That is an essential thing. If you, if you say, I've never experienced that. I just pray and nothing happens. Then you do not have a connection with the God of heaven. Because that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Love, joy, and peace are, is something you're going to feel. You're going to experience. It's not just some idea out there in space someplace. It actually is something you should experience. And so... It's an essential. If you give up easily or you fall often, I guarantee you, you don't have a serious prayer life. Because if you did, 
you would go and experience that peace, that strength, that joy that you need, even when things are not going well. And when that takes place, there is no question in your mind that God is real, that He is alive and well on planet Earth. He is working, and He's working in you. As you worship this morning, I hope the Holy Spirit fell upon you and touched you because that again is the difference between just singing a song and bowing your heart in worship. There is a difference. And that connection with Him is something that you need. Now, if you don't pray, as I said, you're going to faint. But if you do pray, you are going to go through the trial and you're going to come out on the other end of it. Let me read to you what David said in Psalm 57, 1. He said, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. You know, calamities, trials, difficulties in our lives, they always, they pass. Just like the storm came and passed last night. The storms that are in your life are going to come and they're going to pass. And you're either going to be taken away by those storms and taken down, or you're going to go through those storms and come out the other end. Now, understanding that about trials is an essential thing. And it come, you come to that conclusion as you pray. Now, even Jesus prayed more earnestly in the garden. And it is what enabled the Lord, the Father, to strengthen him. This is what Scripture declares. Luke 22, verses 43 through 46. Jesus here is in the garden before his crucifixion. It says, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can you imagine the spiritual warfare that was taking place around him at this particular moment? And what does he do? He prays more earnestly. The angel of God comes and strengthens him and touches him. And then it says in verse 45, when he arose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. You see, they should have been praying. They were not praying. They were sleeping. And what took place? They entered into temptation, and all of them scattered. So the trial is coming. You need to be in serious prayer. You have to have a serious prayer life. Luke says in Luke 18, verse 1, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Notice that Luke connects prayer and not losing heart, not failing, not yielding. Prayer <clears throat> is where you're going to find that strength that you need. And as time draws, draws ever closer to the end, the more you are going to need prayer and to have a serious connection with the God of heaven. So do you have that? If you don't, you need to begin to establish that personal relationship with him. Now the third thing that Peter addresses here is in verses 8 and 9. He de declares that we need to, above all things, have fervent love for one another and be hospitable. To one another. Now, why does Peter bring this up? Well, notice, he says, you need to fix your eyes on that there is an end to your suffering. One way or another, there's an end. 
And that end is drawing nearer and nearer every day. You need to, secondly, you need to, you need to connect with the God of heaven in the midst of your suffering. And thirdly, here in this text, you need to connect with each other. You need to have some kind of connection with others. You need to love others and you need to be loved by others. You need to find hospitality and caring from other individuals. Now Jesus warned that at the end of the age, what? What would take place with the love in this world? He said it would grow cold. Matthew 24, 12. He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And so at the end of the age, lawlessness is going to abound and it is going to get worse and worse, not better and better. It's, that's the clear teaching of Scripture. Second Timothy, Paul told Timothy that in the end times, it would grow worse and worse. So if you're looking for it to get better and better, you're kidding yourself. It's not going to happen. But what's going to happen with you? What's going to occur in your life? Are you going to be filled with the love of God? Are you going to be loving others? I'm telling you, that is one of the most important things in the midst of suffering that you need. You need people. So my question this morning is, if you were ready to end it all this morning, or this has been the worst week of your life, can you think of anybody that you could tell that to, that you could call? Can you say, oh, yeah, I could call him, 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 her, her, her. Oh, no, no problem. I know exactly who I could call. Or do you say, I don't know anybody I could talk to. If it's the latter, you're in trouble. And you will not stand in those difficult days that are ahead for us, the difficult days that are ahead in trial for you and your family. It's not going to happen. You have to have some kind of connection, a real connection with people. That is what the body of Christ is all about. So do you have that? Are you loving others and are you being loved by others now the second question i would ask you is if if you say well I, i've got this person this person this person i could call but the next question is would you actually call them and say i am dying i am hurting i am in trouble i need help i need prayer see there's a many a person that says well i could call so and so easily but they never do it. They don't do it because of their pride. Well, I, don't, I don't want to let anybody know I, I'm struggling. Well, I struggle. You struggle. That's, that is the, that's life. Everybody struggles. I don't care who you are. Billy Graham struggles. Every spiritual leader you have ever met, they struggle just like you do. It's not some strange thing. It's real. It happens. So letting somebody else know you're struggling is, I think it's humility, it's honesty, and it's where you're going to find prayer from someone else. You might be terrible in prayer, but you're going to get prayer from someone else. And that's how people love you. So will you let someone love you? And will you reach out and sincerely love someone else? Notice the word here, fervent. Have fervent love. Now this is in the present tense, which means this is what we should continuously do with one another. We should have fervent love. This word fervent means deep love. To love someone deeply, earnestly, sincerely. It's, a, it's the real thing. It's not some phony, oh, love you, brother, but I don't really care. If you sincerely, fervently love someone, you love them deeply, honestly, and you do something. 
This is what you do. This is how you reach out. Now, in a world that is as cold as stone, I'm telling you, this kind of love is something that sticks out in the world, especially in our world today. When you love somebody, and when people you know, come to you at work and say, hey, can I talk to you? I, I know you're a Christian. Can I, can I talk to you for a minute? I, I'm just really having a difficult time. I'll tell you, that means that you have a good witness, that you are a light if someone will do that. They know that you're not going to put them down. You're not harsh. You're not condemning. They know you've got the real thing. And that's why they're asking you. When a family member is in real trouble and they call you, they're calling you for a reason. Oh, what a privilege that is. What an opportunity that is. And so, because they, they know that they're, they're going to be loved by you. So, be open to that. Be receptive to it. Notice, secondly, he says here, love fervently one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. This is a, a quotation from the book of Proverbs. He's quoting Solomon here. Because he says there in Proverbs 10, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins. And that is what covers the sins of others against you. It's called love. If you don't love somebody, then you're going to hold resentment towards them. If you do love them, you can't hold that resentment in your heart. You've, you've got to let it go. You've got to forgive and let it go. That's what real love is. And it covers those multitude of sins that take place when we offend one another. Then he goes on, he says in verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Now, we all know what grumbling is. That's where you say, what do they think this is? A hotel? They just show up on my doorstep? I mean, what's the deal here? That's grumbling, okay? He says, be hospitable. This literally just means to care for someone who is a stranger. Care for someone who's not a part of your group, your clique, your friendships. Care for other people. Now, why is that so important? Well, when you're caring for other people, you're not focused on yourself. You see, when we're in the midst of suffering, we are focused on ourselves. And one of the simplest ways to get out of your funk is to care about somebody else. Reach out and love and encourage someone else. And so Peter is giving here some great spiritual wisdom, good psychological wisdom. This is just smart. It's just wise to do. Because when you reach out, it's going to lift you up. Because God is going to use you to touch other people. Now, the, the reason why he brings this up is because in the first century, when people were being persecuted, they would flee their homes. And they would go and they would find other believers and those believers would show hospitality to them and help them and encourage them and be a blessing to them. One of the most powerful stories of hospitality and the cost that goes along with hospitality is the story of Corey Tim Boom. How many of you ever read The Hiding Place here? Good. If you haven't, you should. It's an incredible story of love and caring by a Christian family in the midst of Second World War and who hid Jews. But they paid for that. Their entire family perished except for Corey Timbo. They all were sent to the concentration camps and all perished. One of the most powerful stories of forgiveness is told by Corey Timboom in that book. I, I heard her speak at our church before she died. Powerful. She was a real thing. She was beaten by a guard in her prison. 
her sister was beaten by the same guard and as a result of the beating on her sister her sister died she was speaking in a church after the war was over and up walks that guard and says do you remember me and she said oh yes I remember you how could she forget and as she said at that moment she had to make a decision am I gonna love or am I going to hate it was a split-second decision and she said she stuck her hand out to this guy that's powerful and she chose to forgive. You see, hospitality is something you do, but it, it has a cost along with it as well. And especially in a time of suffering, in a time of persecution, there will be costs. And she was willing to pay that price. Now, let me just close this little section here with this particular verse. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. Notice how Paul teaches the exact same thing as Peter in a different context. Romans 12, 10. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another. Kindly affectionate. With brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging or lazy in diligence. Fervent in spirit. There's where you get the power. And here's the motivation, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. This is how you connect to be empowered by the Spirit. He says, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Powerful. What, a, what a, a message, simple message. But that message is a message of love. You need to learn how to love and connect with others and let them love you because that will sustain you in the midst of your suffering. Now, fourth and last here is in verses 10 and 11. Peter gives them two things to specifically do. He says, you are first... He says in verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Then verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God speak. So he tells him two things. He says you need to minister to others. And that naturally follows love. If you love somebody, you're going to minister to them. And then you're going to speak the truth to them. And notice he, speak, he addresses the doing part first. Doing and speaking. He addresses the doing first because that's where it begins. You can't love without doing something. Now, notice he says here that you are to, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. The word minister there is a Greek word used for deacon. It literally means to serve. This is a word that Jesus used in reference to himself. He said, I am a one, uh, among you as one who serves. This is the word he used. I'm the one that is ministering to you. I'm serving you. Now, very interesting and important usage. He says here, you need to serve one another. Help one another. How do you help them? Well, I need to use the gift that God has given me. That's how I can best effectively minister to someone. If God wants me to minister to someone, He is going to enable me with a supernatural gifting to enable me to do that. Now, every single person in this room, every one of you, if you're a Christian, you have at least one spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is given to you to give you the ability to do what he's commanding you to do here. So do you know what that gift is? If you know what that gift is, are you actively seeking to use that gift to minister and serve someone else? So 
Who do you serve? Where do you serve? When do you serve someone else? Now, that is what maturity is all about in the Christian life. This is what I need to be doing. But the question is, do you know what that gift is? If you say, I don't have a clue what my gift is, Steve. Well, I would encourage you then. Go to our website, calvaryag.org. Find my email address. Email me, and I will send you a gift questionnaire that will take you through all of the gifts of the Spirit so that you can try and determine in a, in a more you know, deductive way what is my gift because you need to know what that gift is so that you can then put that gift next to what you can do to serve and minister to someone else. If you don't know that, you can't do it. It's impossible. So you have to understand what your gift is first before you can ever exercise it. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now the words each one there, put your name in there. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to Steve or John or Mary or Sue. Every single one of you has been given a gift of the Holy Spirit so that you might fulfill the work He has given you to do. And you say, well, I don't... He hasn't given me anything to do. Yes, he has. You just don't know what that is yet. But your work, your place of service, the way you do that, he will reveal to you if you're saying, what do you want me to do? That's what Paul said to to Jesus on the road to Damascus. Lord, what do you want me to do? Did the Lord answer him? He did. He said, go into the city of Damascus, wait there, and he sent someone to tell him specifically what he was to do. It says in Mark 13, verses 33 and 34, there Jesus said, take heed, watch and pray. So notice, here is prayer again referred to in this context. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know what the time is. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each one or each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Notice that little phrase there. And gave authority to his servants and to each his work. So every single one of us in this room has been given authority in Jesus' name to do a specific work. What is that? How does the Lord want to use you? Because that is an essential question to answer. God's ability comes through prayer, His love, and His gifting. Essential. Now, once you obtain and understand His gifting, it will always be in association with the next part of this which is in verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. However you serve others, you will always use the word of God. It will always be a key point and part of your ministry. Always. Without the word of God, then I just have nice social deeds being done, good works being done. But the Word needs to always be attached to that work. Now this is where most ministries go wrong, especially uh, social ministries that uh, are doing humanitarian work. When most of these organizations start, they usually are always sharing the gospel And at some point, they deviate away from the gospel, away from the word of God, away from sharing the truth of God as they do the work of God and that humanitarian work. And whenever you divorce those two things from each other, you're in trouble. It's where every book, 
every blog, every church goes wrong. It's when they leave speaking the truth of God, the oracles of God. All the word oracles mean is the utterances or the words of God. So when we, we deviate away from the word of God, I, I'm going to be in trouble. And I am not going to be effective in bringing about God's ultimate end. You know, God wants to touch people in physical, practical ways. He, he wants to feed people, uh, clothe people, but he wants to save their soul as well. And if that doesn't take place, you've just enabled someone to go on in their suffering apart from the Lord. That's all. A great activity, but it needs the gospel to go with it. And so I, I tell you, this is one of the most important aspects. For you as a Christian, if you read a book, if you read a blog, if you go to a church, you need to, that's the first thing you should ask yourself. Are they teaching the Bible? Are they explaining to me practically how to put the Bible into the practice of my life? If that doesn't happen, that's not a book you want to read. It's not a blog you want to be involved in. It's not a website you want to be a part of. It's the first thing I look. When I open up a book, I look, I just flip through the pages. How, how many scriptures are in this book? Now, there can be a whole lot of scriptures in the book, and those scriptures can be out of context. But you don't know that unless you are studying your Bible yourself. So, if you want to speak the words of God, the oracles of God, then you need to be studying the oracles of God. Very important. Uh, something that is imbalanced is just as bad as something that is completely heretical and heresy. Do you understand that? If you start consuming something that is imbalanced, you will become imbalanced. Guaranteed. Now, I have been there. In the beginning of my Christian walk, I got into some really kooky doctrine, so I've got some battle scars here. And that is why I am taking such an amount of time to deal with this, because it's that important. The Word must be given. And then, secondly, who is quoted in a book or a blog or a website? that you read. If the person that is quoted is off or imbalanced or heretical themselves, I mean, it's foolish to continue reading that material. But you have to be the discerning one. If Peter makes this statement, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, that's essential. Now, why is that? Notice the next little phrase. He says, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Now, think about this. The ability that God supplies. If you have a connection with God through prayer, if you are filled with his love, if you are controlled and guided by his word, then God is going to accomplish his ends as the result. That's going to be the result. Very simply, when God gifts you and God speaks through you, God is going to bless you and the person you're ministering to. And ultimately, He will be glorified. People don't, aren't going to, their lives are not going to be changed by my ideas or opinions. People's lives are changed by God's ideas and opinions. And I want my ideas and opinions persuaded by His. Don't you? That is what's going to change you and is what is going to change them. So I encourage you today, be a man, a woman, that keeps your eyes fixed on the end. There is an end coming. 
It's not going to go on like this forever. And then be a man or a woman who is connected and who has a personal prayer life. Be somebody who is loved and is loving other people. Get out of your comfort zone and serve somebody else. And then, ultimately, do that with the ability God gives you by His Spirit using His Word and the gift that He has bestowed upon you. That is where you will find the greatest growth in your own life and the greatest strength in the midst of suffering. Amen? Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, thank You so much that, Lord, we have Your Word your truth. Lord, we have the understanding that you have granted to us of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is best. Lord, help us to make that discernment. Guide us as we, as we walk with you. Lord, I pray that you would draw each and every person in this room into that personal contact with you. Lord, that you would fill us with your love. Lord, help us to love each other sincerely, earnestly, honestly. Father, gift us. Pour out the gifts of your Holy Spirit upon us that we might be used by you. And most of all, teach us your word, Lord, so that we might not stray from the ultimate end and work that you want to do. Lord, we believe you to do that. Keep us, we pray. And this morning, if you are here and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, or maybe you were a Christian and you've turned away, will you respond to his voice, his, his outstretched hand to you today? Because the Lord is here. He's here in the midst of us. If you sense that conviction in your heart, that is his voice. He's drawing you to himself. But will you respond? It's your choice. Here's your opportunity. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, you need to ask. Jesus said, everyone that asks, it shall be given. Will you ask? If you want to follow him and obey him, and be his disciple, then I want you to pray with me right now. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I have broken your law. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me. I want to follow you. If you just prayed that with me, I, will you just... Lift your hand here as a simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you this morning. I want to receive Christ in my life. Anyone here? God bless you. Father, we pray for this heart, this life. Lord, we ask for your transformation to take place. As only you can do, Lord. Work from the inside out. Change and transform this life just as you've done in ours. And Lord, we believe that your Holy Spirit is coming upon this heart, this life. Do your work, Lord. Lord, we believe you to do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.